Hello everyone and welcome to our webinar today. I am not Josiah from Edelrid, as you can tell. I'm Kale from Tree Stuff. Uh, I'm just going to talk a little bit here while more people are coming in uh, and we get everybody ready so that we're not missing anything. Uh, Josiah's got a great quiz at the end of this that you can take uh, to earn two CEUs. Uh, I would pay attention because he's, he's asking some, some tough questions um, and it uh, has some really good information that you're going to want to remember. Uh, first of all, I want to say that uh, we have a couple things going on pretty soon. Uh, we have the Arizona Tree Stuff Party on May 6th. So if you are in Arizona or you're willing to drive a while, then uh, go ahead and check out our Facebook events page. You can get all the information there. It's a free event. It's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, so I believe that Selena McGregor is hosting that. And, um, you know, come on out and meet some people, climb some trees, and everyone is invited. Uh, on May 18th, we have a scannable webinar with Rob Sterling. He's going to talk about uh, some new technology that you can use uh, to stay safe up in the trees, keep your equipment uh, inspected, and uh, make sure that your PPE is always safe and working. You can find information about that on uh, treestuff.com slash webinar, on our Facebook events page, or treestuff.com slash uh, events. After that, we have a large Ohio Tree Stuff party that's going on uh, May 27th through 28th. Uh, it's like a whole thing. There's camping. It's it's going to be a big, it's a blast. It's going to be, it's going to be huge. Go to the Facebook event page to find out more about that or treestuff.com slash parties. Uh, there's also a Colorado party July 1st. There's a Kentucky party July 22nd. Uh, and then in August, we have something that you're going to want to uh, look into right now. It's a thing called Treetopia 2023. Uh, that is our second version of Treetopia out in California. Um, it is now three days instead of two days. And uh, there are there's a whole bunch of tree stuff style games. There's uh, a whole lot of speakers there who are going to be doing some great classes. Uh, throughout the whole time. You can go out and get like 20 some uh, and more uh, CEUs just from taking these classes uh, as well as some vendors that you can go out and talk to and and, and uh, hang out and party with. So it's a great time. We had probably about a thousand people there last time. We pretty much take over the whole island of Mare Island in Vallejo. Um, so come on out to that if you're in the California area uh, and if you're not it is well worth it. Right now, if you go to treetopiausa.com, there are early bird pricing on the tickets. There's also, um, I think there's about 40 spots left for camping out there. We have a cool campsite. It's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, going to be a great place to be. Uh, we only have 50 spots available for that. So get to treetopiausa.com. Um, it's not treetopia.com. Somebody stole that out from under us, but we're working on that. Treetopiausa.com uh, to check that out. So uh, now that that's out of the way, I'm going to move on to what we're here for, which is uh, Josiah. Uh, I will post good point, Josiah. I will post a link to all of this stuff in the chats, um, as well as uh, the YouTube chat over here on Josiah's page. Um, but Josiah is from Edelwood. He's also known as Strider Trees, uh, or Tree Strider, and uh, he has a great webinar that is about pulling stuff, mechanical advantage. And uh, without any further ado, I'm just going to switch over and let him tell you about everything. Awesome. Thanks for that intro, Kale. That Treetopia event was good one last year and I'm excited to do it again. I'll be out there again uh, come, well, I guess it's in the fall, right? Middle August. Yep. Cool. Well, like you said, I'm going to dive right in here. I've got a lot um, and I would love to cover all of it, but I'm also perfectly happy to only get through half of it if it means answering a lot of great questions. So 
uh, throw your questions in the chat, whether wherever you are streaming from, Kale is going to be monitoring that feed. Uh, and as good things, good questions come up, he will, uh, he will shoot those out to me. Um, and we'll have a few different times throughout this talk to be able to kind of break for some of those. And uh, I, I love being able to do that because then I know at least there's someone whose specific question I was able to address. And, and, and that's always, usually if there's one person, then there's several. So <clears throat> like you said, I'm going to be talking about a mechanical advantage. Uh, mechanical advantage is, is kind of a big topic. There's a, there's a lot to it, but it, it breaks down into a very simple idea of uh, how do we multiply the ability of one person or two people or your team, uh, multiply their ability to exert effort in such a way that we can move heavy things <laughs> or keep heavy things from moving. Uh, there's, there's a lot of different applications, so I'm going to cover quite a few different styles of mechanical advantage. Uh, not, there, it's, such a, it's not a one-size-fits-all thing. Uh, you can't have one tool and expect it to be really good in every situation. This is one of those times where uh, if you have a variety of different methods and you have a very complete sort of overall understanding of the concepts, then you can save a lot of time and energy and you can do very extreme pulls. You can, you can apply a lot of force in a safe way. And that's, that's always the challenge with what we're doing is, uh, you know, like I, like I will say in virtually every talk I do, tree work is a process of reducing a big complicated problem into very simple, straightforward steps. It's, it's about minimizing variables and a lot of times being able to pull really hard uh, can simplify a complicated problem, make it a lot easier. You know, the classic example is a spar that's relatively balanced but leaning over a house. You know, if you've got a house here and you've got a big old tree and it's leaning straight over, but you've got an anchor directly opposite the lean, if you can generate enough pool and do it the right way, you can lift that entire tree up off the house or drop it in the yard or whatever. And you've simplified what would otherwise be a very difficult, very risky operation to what is essentially one... Uh, risky operation. And if you do it right, it's really not that risky. It can be very safe. So I'm excited to break this down a little bit. I want to dive in with a very basic uh, kind of overview of a couple of key concepts that I think you kind of have to know to really to grasp this well. And it's, it's a physics concept called vectors. So I, I could explain this, but I actually recorded a video already. Uh, it's going to be on my channel later, and we're just going to show a clip of it here, but it does a much better job explaining kind of the difference between a force, a vector, and torque. So, Kale, if you could start that at uh, 43 seconds, that would be great. Or I, I can jump it to where it needs to be, but you, I guess you've got the audio. Okay, Welcome you want to, to Strider Trees. Today right. we are talking we about over. forces. It's gonna be a little bit of a nerdy conversation. Okay, cool. We're gonna break down Perfect. vectors and torque and all this good stuff so I that you can better it, understand how to take advantage of the 40 strength seconds of the tree to make the audio so we're not breaking out canopy anything anchors useful. that our lives depend on. <laughs> Today this one's sponsored by Edelrid North America and the Academy Trained. I'm here in the Academy uh, down in Santa Rosa where they do awesome there trainings for individual arborists and big companies alike. Uh, we'll check them out here as we get for going. Those of you guys who uh, don't find know, the Academy is a fantastic trainer. All right, we're diving right in. How many of oh, you guys know what a vector okay. is? Ah, if you don't remember that from high school physics, I can't okay, believe good. you. I'm just kidding. Okay, nobody knows. A vector is a more precise describe a description of a force, right? Yeah, my brother we and I went over there. all have some idea of what uh, a force the, is. And just the, the problem with force as, as a unit in and of itself and is that it's not really things. useful because forces are always applied in a direction, right? I, I can't just apply a force. I need to push on something. You know, Newton's third law, every action has an equal opposite reaction. I can only push so long as something's pushing back. So every force has a direction, and that is called a vector. A vector is a force in a direction. And in physics, we will describe that generally as an, like with an arrow, right? And the magnitude of the force, so how big the force is, will generally be described by the size or the length of the arrow, right? And then the direction is the point, wherever the arrow is pointing. So we have a magnitude and a direction associated with every vector. 
And that's important because when we're dealing with working around in a canopy, when we're dealing with climbing around the tree, my body is a weight, and I, my weight exerts forces on the limbs, on the tree as I'm moving around. And the hope is that the forces I am exerting are always less than what the tree can tolerate. Now there's one other concept to consider besides just the vector, and that is torque. Now, torque is a useful measurement, but it refers to forces that are associated with something that has a pivot point. So a torque is, is a force in a direction but against something that, has, uh, that is fixed on one side generally. So torques always refers to some sort of rotational, uh, ro rotational movement. For example, if we come over here, here's my little makeshift branch, right? If I take my finger, well, we'll just pretend this is a vector, right? This is a vector of force. If I exert a force down, my finger is, is a vector of force in the downward direction, I am creating a torque on this limb. And now, as I, you can see, the more force I exert, the more the limb deflects from its resting position. And so this gives you some idea of how much force, and intuitively we know this, right? Like I pull harder, branch bends farther. But it's actually a very, very precise association. And all of these limbs and all of the wood and all the structure is designed to be able to tolerate a certain level of deflection, a certain level of torque. But in some orientations, that force is more tolerated, more easily tolerated than others. For example, if I push, instead of pushing straight down here, if I instead push kind of down, but also kind of in, so I'm pushing at this angle, I can push much harder, with, and it's gonna cause less deflection. Uh, same thing, if I push straight on, I'm gonna use my thumb, because it's a little easier, I'm pushing straight onto that branch, and it's not actually deflecting at all, and I'm pushing way harder. So it's a bigger force vector, but because of the direction of the force, this limb is much more able to tolerate that, that load, that, that, and because it's generating no torque, right? So I'm gonna talk a lot about torque because torque is what tends to break branches. When you've got a limb, when you've got a spready canopy, it's torque that will cause this thing to break, not so much force in line with the grain of the wood. Wood, is super strong. All right, so that's a little clip from a series that I'm going kind of deep diving into vectors there. Um, the uh, takeaway on that, what I'm hoping you guys get is uh, a torque is a vector in a direction, a torque is a vector around a pivot. So a vector, any force that is ever exerted is always exerted we, we describe it as a vector because you can't exert a force without a direction. You can't push on nothing. Uh, it, it's the, you know, Newton's laws of physics demand that any force must have an equal and opposite force, which means it must be acting in, in a direction. There's just no way, there's no other way to do it. But uh, when you have, like with trees, we almost always deal with forces where we are applying a force to one part of the tree, but there is a point where the, the tree or the branch or whatever it is we're trying to move could pivot. And so very often our vector of force is, is actually exerting a torque on something. And it's, that's important because as we deal with some of these systems, as we talk about mechanical advantage, mechanical advantage has the ability to dramatically increase the amount of force at any given moment. So uh, we're going to kind of revisit this picture and this graph, but I just to, to show a little example here, if you can see my pointer, um, here we've got this tree, kind of a generic rigging situation if there was something down here. What we've got is a tension line through a redirect and then through another redirect, and this is just sort of describing in which order you might remove these branches. What needs to be noted here is that the force of these the, of weight, the force of gravity, is always exerting a force in the downward direction. And so we've got this downward force as soon as these limbs are, are hanging or as we add tension. But the beautiful thing about ropes is that they transfer force along their length in tension. And so pretty much any time you see a rope, you know that there is a force being exerted along the length of that rope in the direction uh, or along the line that the rope is taking place, which is, you know, complicated, sounds complicated, but it's intuitively simple. Like everyone gets that. So you pull on a rope, you're pulling in line with the rope because that's the only way to exert a force. Now these, 
uh, deflection points, these redirects as we call them, they are designed to sort of uh, give us a better positioning, maybe prevent the branch from swinging somewhere we don't want, uh, et cetera. But the problem with a bad redirect is that it can apply a torque on a branch, a very significant torque. So if we look at this, this little picture here, we've got a, uh, this redirect in particular. If you can see the angle of the force vector being exerted by this rope in tension on this particular time point is described by this blue arrow. Now that blue arrow is, is a very small force because we, if we look at the angle of the angle of deflection here is really broad. So if I was to compare it back over here to our graph, uh, maybe we've got a 30 degree deflection or something like that. So at best, this branch might be supporting 52% of the weight of what is on the line, maybe roughly. But if that's a big branch, 52% at a bad torque, uh, that could cause damage, especially if this is an included union, if it's a poor union, if there's rod in there, et cetera. So um, perhaps a better positioning for this might have been over here, because then the, the way this spar leans out that direction, that same arrow, that arrow of force, uh, might be pulling that spar more into itself. You know, it's standing it up rather than pulling it over. It's not uh, trying to separate the union, it's actually compressing the union. So over here, even though it's a smaller branch, might actually be a better position for that. Now, I'm not going to get too carried away with, with rigging forces and vectors because that's a whole conversation itself. But it's something you guys have to think about when you're setting up for a big pull because uh, you know if I'm going to pull this whole tree over, I don't want to, uh, I'm applying an enormous torque, uh, hopefully to somewhere fairly high on the tree so that I've got lots of leverage to stand it up and pull it over. But I want to be careful about where I position that. The other thing to note and this is something to, to write down and pay attention. If you ever want to know the exact direction of force through a redirect, you have you draw a bisecting angle. Now, a bisecting angle is an angle that divides this angle in half. So naturally, a, a sling will align along the torque vector. So it'll actually point exactly where uh, that force is being applied. And so in this case, that's not quite perfect, but it's pretty close. It's, it's kind of going like this. And this one's actually... Uh, that's funny. This one's actually going this way a little bit. So if you draw a bisecting angle between uh, uh, in the center of your deflection, then that tells you the direction of the force vector on that um, on on that deflection point. So we'll talk about this a little more. Um, sharing the load, it's it's a useful thing to know. You can kind of spread these forces out in the canopy. Uh, so sometimes if, for example, you've got a big tree, a uh, big spready canopy tree, and you're trying to pull it over, but there aren't any good leads. I'm thinking of like a, a big silver maple where you've got a massive trunk and then all these tall shoots. If you were to run a line through the whole canopy, sometimes you can uh, make all, a whole bunch of really wide open angles so that none of those unions are ever actually seeing all that much force, and you can still pull in the tree really hard. So something to think about, something to consider. Um, like I mentioned before, when we're dealing with mechanical advantages, we're you almost always trying to, to do something hard and we're trying to make it easy. We're trying to, uh, to amplify or magnify a force. Now, force times distance equals work. So the goal of what we're doing is to do work. Uh, anytime you move something, you have done work. So what a lever does is it converts force and distance back and forth. This nice little gif here, we've got a short lever arm and a long lever arm. The short lever arm is experiencing a higher force, but it's traveling a shorter distance. Out here on the far end of the lever arm, we're experiencing a lesser force, but it's traveling a much longer distance because the arc of that, the travel of that part of the lever is farther. Now, this exact same concept is true when it comes to pulley systems. When we're dealing with pulley systems, like for this example here, we've got a four to one system, and this 200 kilogram load is moving one meter up for every four meters of rope that are pulled. So in light of that, 
one of the things we have to plan for, and this is something I'll, I'll revisit again, one of the things you have to plan for is, okay, if I know I'm going to have to pull really hard, I need to build a system that has enough travel in it in order to uh, complete the whole pull. Now, that can be a problem because if we've thrown a whole bunch of pulleys in, in series here, uh, then we may not actually have room to squeeze all those pulleys together. We might, we might run out of room before we actually pull the whole thing over. And there's better and worse ways to build systems that are sort of more, uh, call it space optimized. So certain, certain types of systems are maybe faster or use fewer pulleys, but your, uh, your pulleys end up jamming against your anchor faster. And so you limit how far you can pull. Whereas systems like this, which is kind of a, a basic, it's a simple system or, or a reeve system, you, you have to go through a lot of rope, but your pulleys can be as far apart as you want, so long as you've got you know, five times the rope uh, as the distance you're trying to pull. And so sometimes that, you may not be quite as efficient pull with your pulleys, but you might be uh, more efficient with your, you might be able to get more length because you've got a long rope. So another thing just to consider, but the idea here is mechanical advantage is leverage. And in order to do the work we have, we want to be able to, to amplify our forces. So again, going back to something I said earlier, tree work is about minimizing variables. And one of the variables that is always present on a tree job is personnel. I like to operate with minimal personnel. Uh, when I was running my crew in California, there were usually two guys on the, on the ground and then myself. And that was enough to do most jobs because we were able to sort of optimize our flow. We used machines. Um, I had a GRCS when we were rigging. We had a, a little ditch witch for when things were coming down. You know, one guy could move a big old heavy piece just the same as two or three would have to. And so it made for very efficient work. <clears throat> by using mechanical advantage systems, by using machines, we take some of the variable of personnel out of the equation. Now personnel are fantastic. It's great to have extra help, but they're also a liability. If, you, if someone gets hurt, uh, injuries are a huge expense. Uh, if someone, you know, th and that can happen so easily, even if you're being safe. And you, know, you don't always know, there's someone on your team may not always know all the things that you know, and it might be hard to explain. So there's gonna be some compromises in time and training and all these sorts of things. A lot of complications that get introduced by more people. So sometimes we can uh, make leverage work to our advantage and avoid having extra personnel. We can save ourselves some injury. Uh, we can set up systems that maximize our efficiency without, uh, without adding more variables, without overcomplicating things. All right. When we're setting up mechanical advantage systems, there are a handful of things that are really important to consider. Um, these are, these are a few of the prominent ones. Um, I'm gonna run through some questions that, that you should ask yourself every time you're setting up for a big pull. And this is the case through all different types of pulling as well. So sometimes you're pulling, uh, like I said, you know, I'm gonna keep using an example of pulling a tree over because that's one of the classics, but sometimes you're lifting branches, sometimes you're pulling equipment out of a ditch, uh, sometimes you're maybe trying to roll a log or, or drag some brush up a hill. There's a lot of different scenarios where you might be employing a mechanical advantage system. And anytime you're setting that up, these are all factors that you need to look closely at. So I'm going to go through a few of these, starting with worst case scenario. So using that tree over house example, um, we need to look at the worst case scenario. Is this thing backed up? Is there, is there any scenario where that tree lets go and falls back and ends up on the house? Um, when, when I am building, when I'm going through any process in tree work, one of the things I think of is, okay, let's, Simplify this until I can tolerate the worst case scenario. So even if everything goes wrong, that is an outcome I can accept. <laughs> uh, so that means, you know, uh, avoiding circumstances where someone could die, obviously. Um, so if you're pulling a tree over and your guy pulling the rope is within the range of the tree falling, that's a worst case scenario in that situation, someone ends up dead. That's not an acceptable outcome. You need to change your, you know, the, the, the strategy must change. You know, if you don't have enough rope, well, then you got to buy another rope or figure out a system where you can use what you've got uh, and, and keep personnel out of that, that crash zone. The same is true with sometimes when things cut loose early. 
when you're working around a pivot, when you're trying to stand up a tree or maybe you're working and you're not pulling it directly against the lean, maybe it's got a little bit of side lean too. And you're concerned about the possibility of the hinge breaking or even, you know, maybe you're cutting it and maybe you just cut the hinge a little bit early and that tree could pivot. Where is it going to end up? You know, even if that, that line holds, uh, a tree can fall up to 90 degrees away from the direction where you're trying to pull it. Um, so if that is a possibility, if that's a concern, solution for that. I don't know if I, everyone just lost me there, if that was something, small, but anyway, uh, so, okay, good. <laughs> Uh, distance from targets. That's another big one. So like I said, if, if you're pulling over a tree, um, how close are various things of value? Um, can you get everything out of the radius of that tree? Like I said, if you're only pulling with one line, uh, it could fall anywhere within the 180 degree circle uh, in the direction of your line. And, and so that there may be unacceptable outcomes and we should look at either moving the stuff, moving personnel, or introducing a second or a third guy line so that we can be confident that the tree's gonna go where we put it. Setting a couple extra lines, while it can be tedious, can also be efficient. Like that can be the fastest way to get the tree done. If instead of climbing it, making a dozen cuts and rigging those out and then setting a line, if instead I can just put a second line through the tree, anchor it off well, add another mechanical advantage system, lock it off, and then I'm good, well, then that can be a great way to solve the problem. Again, it simplifies it. We're reducing variables. We're taking you know, 15 cuts and a climber in the tree and some rigging out of the equation and in introducing uh, a, a rope, <laughs> which hopefully you know the condition of your ropes and you're able to, to judge whether it's gonna be sufficient or not. Um, so that kind of covers the where things go if something breaks in a similar, it's, it's a similar thing there. Um, the weakest links is another thing to know. You know, how good are your ropes? How new are they? Uh, rope stretch energy storage. So anytime you're pulling hard, you are introducing uh, potential energy into these ropes. All of our ropes have some stretch to them. Nylon, polyester, they're all designed to stretch to some degree. Even Amsteel, even Dyneema, which we'll talk about a little bit more as well. Um, it has some stretch. And so as you pull harder, you're introducing that uh, potential energy. And if something cuts loose, things could go flying dramatically. Uh, I, I was on a job one time, something broke somewhere and I thought a gun had gone off, you know, and you look around and there's a big old dent in the back of the truck from the rope that had sprung and slapped the back of the truck. And there's things that went wrong in that scenario. It wasn't a bad accident because all the worst case scenarios were acceptable, but it was, uh, you know, I was down a rope, the rope broke in half, and that was a bummer. So it's important to know what the weakest links are. Um, generally, you want your rope to be the weakest link. Um, sometimes if you're using rope clamps, like, like these guys, or a hand ascender, they can be a really fast way to add progress capture to a line. So this is just an Aylerid Unisender. Um, it's just a, a cam descender with a little bit of teeth in here, moves one way along the rope. It can be a, a really fast way to attach a five to one system to add some tension. These are really only good for, for they, this one in particular is good for up to four kilonewtons. That's what they say is the limit. These things will tend to strip the sheath off of rope. Um, all of this style uh, cam, tooth cam, they're really hard on the sheaths. So they will tend to strip the sheath off uh, somewhere between four and seven, depending on the device, depending on the rope, a lot of variables there. And just so you know, four kilonewtons is, is one of these guys. These, these have an MBS of 4KN. So uh, if you're using this, but you wouldn't pull on it with this, then, uh, then maybe you got to switch it up. You know, one of the ways you can use these more effectively is putting it towards the input side of your mechanical advantage system. So if I've got a five to one, my first pulley is only seeing twice whatever I'm able to pull, whereas the last pulley or the, the tie-in point at my load is seeing roughly five times what my initial input force is. So if I have this, my first pulley on this and I'm only pulling 100 pounds uh, or 150 pounds, and so at most it's seeing 300 pounds, man, that's, that might be okay. But I wouldn't use one of these for a system where more than one or maybe two people at the most are pulling on it at any given time. So these can be the weakest link. 
Um, it's also nice to have uh, friction hitches because those these you can kind of program to be the weakest link. So a lot of times, again, if you're using a one of these to attach a pulley to a rope. I doesn't have to be this one or there's, you could have bigger, stronger ones, whatever. But if you're using this, a lot of times you can tie a knot in such a way that it'll hold really, really well when you want it to, but at a certain load, it'll start to slip. And uh, the, the, there's no way to, to guess just what that's going to be. You kind of have to guess and check. Um, certain knots, certain friction hitches hold better than others. If you tie it tighter with more wraps, you're gonna get more bite out of it. But a lot of times, uh, if you do it right, you can make this slip before anything else is going to break. And that can be a good thing to know. Um, one of the things I like to do is mount one of, mount my pulley with one of these guys, and then I'll use a backup knot below it. So I'm not weakening my primary pull line with a knot, uh, but that knot serves as a stopper. So if this does start to slip and it hits that knot, then it'll stop. So it's kind of a, a two-layer system where I get to see how close to my limits I'm pushing. Because the reality is, if we're pulling with 5 to 1, 12 to 1 systems, if we're pulling with a, a rope jack through a 2 to 1, if we're pulling with machinery, a lot of times we're pushing limits. Um, and that's, it's good to know where those limits are, and it's good to be able to experiment and have sort of progressive ways to um, sort of get data for our own experience about how close to those limits we were. Now, obviously, with a backup knot, well, now I'm, I'm not going to get the advantage of slipping anymore. And if it catches now, something else is going to break. And I should know what that's going to be. Uh, but it's just it's a good way to be sure and be safe uh, and, and to something you can look at later to see just how much load maybe you put on it. Now, if you ever do that, obviously, you got to test it first. So one of the things to consider with rope stretch energy storage uh, and uh, regarding weakest links as well is that ropes all have a, a what's called like cycles to failure. So ropes, when you buy a rope, it'll have an MBS, a minimum breaking strength. And that minimum breaking strength is an estimate based on testing where they take a whole bunch of samples of a rope, break it, and they chart out at what load that that rope broke. Uh, with a straight pull and there's a lot of different methodologies here it's not there's no guarantee that your method of pulling will result in the same breaking strength uh, ropes have a lot of characteristics for example uh, if you pull really hard and fast you don't get as much peak load if you pull slow and then stop and then pull some more and then stop and then pull some more and stop a lot of times you get a much higher number but it's hard to know what those numbers uh, what testing methodology the company actually used. And so take those MBSs with a grain of salt. Don't count on it always to do that, but it's also worth knowing that that MBS is only guaranteed for a brand new rope. Now, because of the idea of cycles to failure, every time I approach that minimum breaking strength, every time I approach the physical limit of the rope, I am decreasing what's called the reserve. So a rope will have, you know, a certain number of cycles where it's going to be reasonably strong, but the more often I approach a higher percentage of its MBS, the, the less reserve it will have for, to give a, make that more clear. Say I've got this line here. This line is a woodpecker, 11.7 millimeter. It's good for about 6,000 pounds roughly, right? So if I, um, if I'm using it to climb and I only ever put at the most 200 pounds on it, maybe 300 if I take a little slip and drop into it dynamically. 300 pounds is uh, half of, was it 2% uh, of what this rope can hold. It's a pretty small percentage. Um, I could essentially do that. I could cycle it with that thousands of times, probably tens of thousands of times before I'm going to deplete the reserve. But if I then use this rope to rig a branch and it's a 300 pound branch, but it drops three feet. And now all of a sudden this rope is experiencing a 600 pound load. Well, that's 10% of the ropes minimum breaking strength. And now this rope may only be able to tolerate that kind of loading, maybe a few hundred times, not, not tens of thousands. So that's kind of what I mean. If I were to then put a 5,000 pound load, well, maybe it would hold, uh, but maybe I could only put a 5,000 load on it four times, three times, who knows exactly. Uh, if you look at 
the dynamic uh, testing for rock climbing ropes. They test them for, they don't actually give an NBS, they give a number of UAA, UIAA certified falls. So they have a testing apparatus where they drop a, a weighted body onto the rope and the rope catches that weight. And it has to be able to catch that weight a certain number of times in order to be approved for that function. And then you can see those, those lines will all say rated for four falls or seven falls. And it's a, it's a measurement that tells you a lot more because yes, something with a higher number of falls might be a stronger rope or it might just be better energy absorption. It's hard to say, but it gives you the idea that, that there's a reserve to it and you don't want to deplete the reserve. So if you're pulling with your really old ropes, don't count on it to, to max out its strength. Don't count on it to hold if you're, if you're approaching the limit of what its original NBS was. Uh, that, would be, that would be really risky business. If you know you've got a critical operation, you've got a, a job where you know you're gonna have to pull really hard, sometimes I'll buy a new rope just for that. You know, if I'm gonna do a big nasty tree over a house and it's gonna cost the client 3,500 bucks or whatever. You know, if I spend 200 bucks on a new rope, at least I have the peace of mind that I know what my pull limits are gonna be. So uh, that can be, can be useful as well. Go to the next slide here. Both when it comes to real work and uh, in, my in my conversation here in my PowerPoint, um, I want you guys to think KISS, keep it simple. Um, obviously there are, there are so many different types of systems. I've gone and struck out this complex system uh, everything I'm going to describe to you is either going to be a simple or a compound system. These compound systems uh, are much more easy to conceptualize than a complicated mechanical advantage system. It's harder to get a handle on just exactly what the uh, mechanical advantage is, and it's useful to be able to do quick mental math and, and have an idea of how hard you're pulling because generally when we're in these situa situations, we want to pull with the least necessary force. Uh, over pulling is rarely a good idea. This is, you know, I, I love the phrase <laughs> overkill is underrated. And while a lot of situations that's true, when it comes to pulling, we really don't want to over pull. Um, a lot of, a lot of circumstances can, a lot of negative circumstances can result from over pulling. There was this awful reel on Instagram the other day going around of this guy who was taking a top uh, and it looked like he had his face cut and he was starting into his back cut. His face cut wasn't exactly in line with the weight or it was being pulled. It looked like it was being pulled. Um, and the whole thing barber chaired on him before he was halfway through his back cut and came down and clobbered him. And that's, that's, that's a problem. Like we can't, that's not a good solution. So it's useful to know just how hard you're pulling uh, at least to have some kind of an estimate. And so I say, let's stick with simple and compound systems. Stick with what you know and what you can understand. Uh, as you get better at these, you will be able to understand them better and it'll be more obvious to you just how hard you're pulling. Uh, the other thing that you really have to know and pay attention to is when you've got a pulley that is a redirect and a pulley that is actually giving you mechanical advantage. So if you look over here at the fixed and movable, both these pulley scenarios involve one pulley and two loads of line, two, two legs of line. But in the leftmost scenario, the fixed one, that person is not actually, they don't have any mechanical advantage. All that that is serving is as, is as a redirect. He's pulling exactly the same as the weight of that weight of the load. Now, if you look over here, we've got two legs of line and a pulley, but the pulley is moving. Uh, and in this one, you actually do have mechanical advantage. There's two legs of line and each leg of line is seeing half the load in this scenario where the pulley is, is moving. And so he'll actually get some mechanical advantage out of that. Now compound pulleys, um, this isn't a very good example of a compound pulley <laughs> uh, because this guy is pulling and he's pulling half the load here, half the load here. So he's getting a two to one mechanical advantage, but he's got two pulleys in there. This one is again, only a redirect. So it, you have to know when you're setting up something, uh, you have to be able to calculate and, and, and recognize when a pulley is serving as a redirect or when it's actually providing mechanical advantage. So I'm gonna go through um, a little bit later on, I'm gonna set up a whole bunch of different pulley systems for you guys. 
Um, please leave your questions in the chat about those pulley systems. If there's one you like to see, uh, if there's one, I'm, I'm going to show you probably three of my favorites at a, and a couple of different variations if we have the time. Uh, but that'll be that'll be as we get a little bit deeper here. I'm I'm a big fan of compound mechanical advantage systems, and I'll we'll demonstrate some of those because I like to use those big old blue. Uh, I guess they're CMI arborist blocks. They're fantastic. They're burly as all heck, and um, and they're really smooth. They have great efficiency, and I've just you got a couple of them, so why not string them together? You can get a lot of mechanical advantage with relatively few number of pulleys using those types of systems. The simple five to ones, generally when you buy a complete system, uh, like a Jag or a Edelred Ka, you, those are simple five to ones. You've got a, they're called sheave block systems. They're all together and it's a simple system. So I'll demonstrate a couple of those as well. So let's talk about rope. What is a good rope for what? Um, Hopefully you guys are familiar with these kind of basic, these are all the some different types of rigging ropes. Um, I am categorizing these somewhat differently and I will go through why, but uh, if you have any questions about any specific rope, just let me know. I'm gonna go through these because I think these are all useful and they're ones that hopefully most everyone has seen. So the first one here is the rope that you might have on a Mazda rope puller. It's a three strand rope. Uh, generally, these are very stretchy. They have a lot of twists to them, um, but they're cheap. They're cheap and they're pretty durable and they hold up well to kind of natural crotch uses. Uh, this is not one I would recommend for any sort of heavy pulling. Uh, what you'll find is that they tend to twist as you load it. And so if you've got it through a two to one, sometimes it'll twist up the two to one and add a whole bunch of friction and just completely negate all the advantage you had. Uh, I'm, I'm not a huge fan of the Mazda rope puller for that, well, that being one of the reasons. But it's, um, again, if we're trying to simplify the process, trying to eliminate variables, a rope that has a lot of stretch and twist is adding variables that I don't want to deal with. So here is, is a little bit of an improvement. Again, this is kind of an older rope. This is Samson Blue Streak, pretty common. There's there's a few others, like Teufelberger makes high V. It's uh, your 16 strand solid braid. This stuff is, is, again, pretty burly. It holds up pretty well in natural crotch. A lot of folks have this stuff around. It, it's been around the industry a long time. But again, this one has quite a bit of stretch. However, it's much more dimensionally stable. It doesn't tend to twist nearly so badly. So this one's not a bad one for light duty rigging um, if, you, if you've got it and you need it. The rope clamps will hold on really well on that stuff. Um, but uh, again, a little bit stretchy. Just so you know, a half inch three strand rope this one in particular is good for about 50, 100 pounds MBS brand new. This Samson Blue Street is good for 69. That's almost 2,000 pounds stronger. So they're the same diameter, but you get a lot more strength out of this type of rope construction. Jumping up uh, one more, we've got Dinosorb, which is a, a little more sophisticated line. Now, Dinosorb is a, it's in, the, in the name, Dyna, it's dynamic. So it is actually great for negative block rigging. So if you're pushing chunks and you want to catch something, you want to absorb that energy and you don't want it to shock load your anchor point. So you want something that's a little bit stretchy. Dinosorb is great. Um, it's also fairly inexpensive because it's nylon polyester construction, uh, super simple stuff. It's strong too, because nylon is very strong. Uh, that's good for about 10, five. So again, you're a couple thousand pounds, two and a half thousand pounds stronger than this blue streak. Next we've got here, uh, yeah, let's say this one's Dinosaur. The blue one here is Dinosaur. This bottom one here is Pelican. It's Ape by Pelican, which is an all polyester rope. And um, this is actually my kind of go-to rigging rope under most scenarios. It's not particularly big, uh, but it's very static. So I can get a lot of wraps on, on the GRCS. It'll fit in there. I can pull a couple thousand pounds. It doesn't stretch. It doesn't twist. It's a very robust rope. It's polyester on polyester. It's not very expensive. It's a very, it really is a very simple double braid. Um, but I find that, that that works for me as long as I'm running through metal hardware. Now, both of these will glaze and they will burn up really badly if you're running them natural crotch. Uh, so that's, you, you'll go through a lot of expensive rope if you do that. Wouldn't recommend it. Um, now, Pelican Ape's good for 11,000 pounds. So it's actually even just a little bit stronger than Dinosaur of the same diameter. Now, here I've got, 
a chunk of am steel. So this is half inch am steel. Anyone want to take a guess at what half inch am steel weighs? or how much load it can handle. 34,000 pounds. So uh, Amsteel's Dyneema is one of those UHMPE uh, ropes. The qualities vary dramatically. So careful buying the cheap UHMPE from China. Uh, some of that's okay. Some of it is way less strong. Uh, be careful uh, if you're using that for winch line or whatever. This is something that's almost completely replaced cable for uh, winches for rescue rigs, if guys who are pulling trucks out of ditches, uh, a lot of the really heavy duty lifting lines on giant cranes in, in the uh, marine industry. This is a great line because it's completely static. It is far more static even than straight polyester. Uh, it also has very, the advantage of that staticness is that it has very little stretch. So if it does get loaded and loaded and then break, there, it doesn't store much energy. So you have less danger to personnel, bystanders, whatever. Um, so that can be a huge advantage if you imagine like, you know, when you're towing a rig out, you don't want to have your tow line break and then have something metal go flying through the window of the car that it holds onto. This tends to be a lot safer for those sorts of high, high strength, high towing, um, high pressure operations. The downside is, particularly in our industry, it's not terribly abrasion resistant. It's really expensive and it's slippery. It's really slippery. So it's difficult to have progress capture. It's difficult to, like you couldn't just wrap a hitch cord around it and expect it to bite. Um, it's gonna, if you're wrapping around a porter wrap, you know, you'll get a bunch of wraps on it, but it might still slip. And it's also, it's overkill. Like it's so much more strength than you really need. This last one here, is called Krypton D. It's a relatively new product from, uh, from Pelican. And it actually has Dyneema in the core, but polyester on the outside. So it has the potential to kind of be the, the perfect middleman between the super static poly and then your am steel. This Krypton D is good for 19,000 pounds at half inch, which is kind of just outrageous. It's still, that's not quite double dinosaur at the same diameter, but that's because it's got that Dyneema core. Uh, it's gonna milk a lot. It's gonna be expensive. But this would be a good static lifting line as well, potentially. They make uh, crane slings out of these things, usually a little bit thicker because cranes lift very statically. Um, this, I'm looking forward to getting to play with some of this here in the near future. I'm going to see how it interacts with my GRCS. But those are some, some different constructions and different material types. But the, the important takeaway is to know is that, hey, uh, when you're lifting, when you're pulling, when you're dealing with a lot of tension, uh, best to use relatively low stretch lines. It makes things simpler, safer, more predictable. If you are doing dynamic uh, pulling, if you are, uh, like I said, dropping, dropping chunks, if you are trying to pull something a relatively long way or you're pulling with your truck and you, you don't have perfect consistency with your pull, well, then sometimes something a little bit more uh, dynamic can be good as well. But generally, I like to keep things simple when I'm dealing with pulleys. When I'm pulling by hand, I'll go static as much as possible. Um, when you're pulling, go ahead there. Cool. Well, I'm almost through. Yeah, I think, I think we're doing all right. You, get, you got any good questions? I'm going to have a, a chance for that here in just a I'm probably not going to tie any of these knots, but. Okay. Cool. Well, I'm going to just keep, keep rolling here. Uh, when we're pulling hard, obviously uh, knots jam up hard. And it's good to know some knots that are easy to cut loose. These are all ones I like. Uh, the timber hitch is, is the go-to for a porter wrap. A figure eight on a bite is great for a termination knot. Um, People will argue that that's hard to untie. If you tie it properly, it's not bad. And what the important thing is that you know the load strand is not wrapped around the bottom. You want the, the load strand up above, and that keeps it um, uh, on those two. But it's something you'll have to look up. It's, it's not easy to describe. Obviously, bowlins are great, but a bowlin will take at least 60% of the rope strength out. So this is one of the weaker knots, but it does untie very easily. Bowlin on a bite is similar. Except you can tie that midline very quickly. It's like, that's a good a good knot for, uh, again, for a midline loop of some kind. 
flakes hitch, y'all climb on that. If you're going to, it's just a friction hitch for a single line, VT. Uh, again, that's what I'll use on my hitch cord if I'm putting a pulley midline a lot of times. Uh, and you can pull on it really hard and it'll cinch down, but it'll still come loose super easily. Alpine Butterfly, and this one is called the Circus Bolin. Of the two, I prefer the Circus Bolin. Uh, it's a little bit hard to visually tell when it's tied correctly, but it comes out a lot easier. The Alpine Butterfly can can really jam up hard uh, if you're if you're pulling hard on it. So these are all great knots to know, and I will be using a few of these here as I uh, demonstrate. Now we're gonna dive into a bunch of different uh, use cases and and sort of a couple different methods of pulling here in the next section. So if that's what you're looking forward to, then that's coming up. Um, with each of these different use cases, the main points of consideration are, okay, how much control do I have? Because again, we don't want to over pull. Over pulling can get you into trouble um, or under pull. Yeah, we got to be able to pull enough. So that's output force. You know, how, how hard can I pull? You know, can I use this thing to, uh, to pull, lift something heavy or am I fairly limited? The distance of pull. So how, how far can I move it in one go without having to reset or change the system? And setup difficulty, if you've got groundies or if you've got relatively untrained people or new people on your team, how hard is it to set up? How hard is it to train? And cost, is this expensive? Does it, is it really gear intensive or does it uh, use a lot, of, a lot of equipment? Those are all different characteristics and I'm kind of rated a bunch of these uh, on those different categories. All right, so here's a few different use cases and, and you'll see what I mean by dynamic and static. So if I'm introducing lean, uh, if I've got a tree that's, that's static and I'm trying to pull it over, that's a dynamic pull. I, I need to continue to pull it the whole way through, at least until it's leaning in the proper direction and falls. Um, and so dynamic pulling methods uh, are, are kind of harder and most of these are, are gonna be great for static, but some are gonna be better for dynamic. So I'll kind of delineate that a little bit as we run through these obviously guying for controlled felling. So if I've got one dynamic pulling line to try and go it the right way, and I might have a second line where I just added tension and then locked it off so that it can't go 90 degrees to the lean and then, then it can only go the way I'm pulling it. So that would be, uh, that's a static purpose. Generally, you just need to create some tension, lock it off. Installing cable, like if you're gonna got two leads going out different directions, you wanna pull them together a little bit before you install cable. Again, that's static, you pull it and then it sits. Uh, you do your work and then you take it down. Tension, tensioning rigging systems, that can be static or dynamic. Sometimes you just tension it, lock it off, and sometimes you need to actually lift it all the way up. I love rigging with a GRCS, being able to tip tie and stand up a branch and then have it pop up all, all nice and smooth and safe. Uh, dragging material, I've set up highline systems to drag brush up a hill. That can be great, but that's dynamic. You need a really long pull distance. Uh, removing snags, hangers. Again, that can be one or the other, um, but sometimes it's a great way to get it. Instead of climbing up the tree to knock out the hazardous thing, let's just uh, throw a rope in it, pull on it really hard, see what happens. Sometimes that's a good option. Equipment rescue, that's more of a dynamic situation. Aerial rescue, uh, again, that's, that's more of a dynamic lift. It can be static as well, though. Sometimes you can just lift them, transfer them over, lower them, and then you're out. It's good to know, it's good to have, like I said, more than one system in your pocket, more than one tool in your toolbox, because different systems will perform very differently in these different circumstances. All right, so jumping into the easy ones here, let's start off with people power. Um, <laughs> how many people you got in your crew how, is how hard you can pull. I did some testing outside just with myself on a load cell and, uh, and, and made some educated guesses about what your average guy is gonna be able to pull. I could pull just a little bit harder than this, uh, but this is probably pretty close. So if I was completely braced and I pulsed and pulled as hard as I could in kind of a dynamic way, I'd get up to about, I got up to about 300 pounds. Um, and, but if I was holding steady, you know, at, at most I was getting about 150, 160 at myself, average guy 140 pounds. That's not a lot of force, but if you can, Steady hold, lock it off on the tree, and then vector it. Uh, I was able to get a peak load of 700 pounds just by myself. So uh, I will demonstrate what a vectored line is. In fact, let's just show you that right now, Kale, if you want to swap over to this guy, because it's worth 
just worth describing here. So I've got my line here. I'm pulling between these two points. There's one on either end here. What I say by a vector, I'm adding a bunch of tension here, and then I come over and I pull in the middle. So remember our little deflection diagram? That little deflection diagram that we, uh, we looked at showed that I can actually apply a whole lot of force to either end of this rope by pulling in the middle. Problem is I'm changing the vector. I'm changing the direction of the pull. So as I, the farther I go this way, the less force I have and the less in line with between my two points, the vector is. So it's not always ideal. It's got a very short pull length, but that would be, that's what I call the bow and arrow or the vectored pull. It is a, a very useful, practical way to, to do short, hard pulls. It's, it can be cheap, it can be expensive, depending on how you like to pay your people. Uh, it's super easy to set up. You obviously just have everyone go grab the rope. Um, you're limited in your distance by how tired people get, but, and you're limited in your strength by how strong your people are. But it can be useful, and that's where we, we add pulleys in and stuff to make, make things better. Oh, my dog just got in. All right, uh, progress capture methods for people pulling. So I've got a number of these here. Um, oh, excuse me, just one second. So when you're setting up a people pulling progress capture, uh, when you're setting up for people pulling, that is where you will often use a pulley, uh, one, two, maybe more, but that's where you're gonna build a system. And it's useful to have a, a method of progress capture because it's a lot harder for everyone to stand there and hold at full force than it is to pulse and then lock off the tension that you generated. So these are a whole bunch of different progress capture methods. Uh, obviously, you've got the Porter app. We can use a friction hitch, uh, rope clamps, belay devices, uh, tree wrap. Then they each have their, their pros and cons. Uh, I'm going to demonstrate a couple little techniques here. We've got some video clips coming up, but... I just want to run through a couple little pros and cons. Obviously, I already mentioned the rope clamps, uh, blade devices. So like the megawatt or the, the CMC clutch, those are, are blade devices. But guys in rescue often use those as anchors, and you can use them to, as progress capture. But what they, they will tend to slip at about 5KN. At least that's what the megawatt's rated for. Most of them are pretty similar. That's what the, the standard is, because part of the safety factor of these devices is that if you take a hard fall on a static line, it should slip a little bit rather than transferring all that energy into your body. So uh, you're not gonna be able to hold a whole lot of power, hold a whole lot of tension, but as the last part on a line, on a, on a pulley system, you don't need as much tension. Uh, and 5KN is still close to a thousand pounds. So that's gonna be plenty for one or two people. So if you can pull the, pull the rope and add tension, then it'll hold it. So that can be a good way to go. Of course, it's a little expensive. Now the tree wrap technique, I will demonstrate as well, but it's a good way to very quickly lock off a rope with a little bit of tension with 150, 200 pounds. So, Kale, if you want to go ahead and play that the Porter App sweating video there. Now, this is going to be a quick little technique demonstration of how to get some tension and capture it on the Porter App. So this technique is called sweating, and it's pretty straightforward, but it's a good way to get uh, some more tension on a line. You go and put your half wrap on the porter wrap. Sometimes I'll use a full one. Um, and the idea is if I hold a little bit of friction here with my left hand, I can use a bow and arrow technique to add tension to my line. And then I can pull the slack out with my other hand. I'll just show you that again. I'm pulling bow and arrow, adding tension, and then I'm transferring the slack down with my other hand, maintaining tension. And then I can lock that off using the cleats on the porter app. So now I've got a decent amount of tension. So this technique is called sweating and it's pretty straightforward, but it's a good way to get. Uh... Cool. So that technique there is called sweating. If you've got some good skills in sweating the line, uh, I've found that you can get roughly the same amount of tension as you can when you're just pulling as hard as you can. So maybe 100, 120, 140 pounds if you're really good at it. Uh, the next so that's uh, the next little method here that is sort of an alternative to sweating. And this is, uh, again, for pulling in line. You can sweat something horizontally or vertically. Now, that's a great first, <laughs> first screen there. 
But uh, Kale's going to go ahead and show this other uh, technique. This is one I prefer if I'm going to be just locking off a line, uh, particularly guy lines or whatever, but it, it works quite well. So there's a couple of ways if you need to fasten a line under a little bit of tension. Uh, there's a couple of ways to do that on a tree here, and so I'm going to demonstrate those real quick. Uh, obviously, here I've got a port wrap already set up, so I'm going to put a half wrap in. And the first thing I'm going to show you guys is just kind of the lateral version of the sweating, the technique that I showed you before. Oops, there. So sweating, again, just like we did when it was up high, you pull bow and arrow tension and then you transfer that tension to the other hand. In this case, I'm going to pull here and I'm going to take tension with my other hand. I'm going to pull here and then take tension with my other hand. So that's one way to then capture some tension by hand. I've got a relatively tensioned line here. It's not a lot of tension, but usually that's enough to lock something off. All right. I got the wrong video there, but uh, Kale, see if you can find the other one. It's uh, where I, I pull on the rope real hard, then kind of swing around the tree. If you find it, just uh, shout out. I'm going to jump to the next slide there. So after hand pulling, uh, the next thing that many of you have probably seen or tried are these come-alongs. Uh, obviously, they're cheap. They don't pull very long, but they pull pretty hard. And you have decent control because you're actually there cranking it. So you got that manual feedback. You know how, much, how hard you're pulling in some sense. And so you do have some more control. Um, it's hard to tell exactly because you have quite a bit of mechanical advantage. And they can pull really hard. Um, the setup is, is pretty simple, though, which is nice. And they're cheap. They're really cheap. These are not something I would generally recommend. They're hard to release. Uh, they are kind of slow and cumbersome, and it is a little bit difficult. And the, because the pull is so limited, you're, they're really only good for very short sections, and it takes a lot of time to reset them. So while it is a cheap solution and it can work, it's not one I would pull out of my box very often, but it's good to know in, in comparison to some of these other ones, and maybe that's all you'll have one day. Awesome. Kale's going to jump back in here and uh, show that other clip here. One other way to secure a line under tension uh, by hand, other than using the porter app, and I find I can actually get a little bit more tension with this method. So I'll brace my feet against the trunk, pull as hard as I can, get, capture all that tension with friction by going around the trunk. So I'll go ahead and give it two wraps here. I'm really only pulling a bite through. And then we'll lock this off with a clove hitch. And I find that I can actually capture quite a bit more tension with this method than I can even with using the porter wrap and sweating it properly. So if you master that technique, it I find it's about 20% better than uh, sweating the porter wrap well. And it's really quick and you don't need to set up the porter wrap. So, if you're just locking up and off, or if you're gonna use that bow and arrow vectoring technique I showed you before, uh, that's a great way to do it. Uh, it's super fast, quick, simple, uh, and you can capture that tension really well. The, the key to that is to maintain friction around the tree, maintain tension on the rope the whole way around. And if you go around the tree a second time, uh, then it's really easy to, to lock off that clove hitch or the, the two half hitches in such a way that you don't lose that tension. So that's a, the tree wrap method, love it. It's a good one. All right. So jumping on the Mazdam rope puller. Some of you guys have seen these. It's a, a takeaway of the come along. Obviously, you can pull a lot farther with it. But I already mentioned I'm not going to take too much time. It's got a few major problems. I, I use these a lot early on. I had a lot of tree companies who would put two or three of them in the same tree to pull them over. And you know, just keep adding more if you need more pull. But uh, in that sense, they're simple. You know, obviously, they, they work pretty reliably. Uh, the setup difficulty is minimal. They're, again, they're fairly inexpensive. But they don't pull that hard, and the control is bad, and they're hard to back up. That's the problem I always had with them. Once you start pulling near limits, they start to slip. And you know because they start to slip. But they're, because the way the rope goes around and then goes the other direction, you can't just back them up to the tree that you're anchored to. You have to back up in another direction. And that's kind of it gets to be hard to do. And I don't like something that can slip when overloaded, but also can't be backed up easily. So combine that with the fact that it has to use triple strand, which then twists. It's not, doesn't, it ends up being kind of a poor option for doing a simple two-to-one with it. 
uh, you can sort of separate the vectors, have the, the rope anchored on anchored to one tree. <laughs> I will try to move my hands. You have anchored to one tree through the pulley and then back to another tree where you're cranking and that kind of keeps it from twisting up because you've created some space, but you also reduce your efficiency of your, of your uh, mechanical advantage by opening up the angle. Uh, obviously when your ropes are parallel and directly in line with your pull point, that's when you're getting the maximum pull out of whatever your system is. So I don't use these much anymore, I'm not crazy about them, but they, uh, they have their place and many of you probably have. What I've replaced them with in my uh, operations is the CMI rope jack. Again, this actually works well with a double braid. It's a little more versatile. You can use a lot of different ropes with it. It's not so picky. It doesn't slip. It'll break. You can't pull it too hard. Uh, you, like, you don't want to put two guys or three guys on that crank handle when you're adding tension. But with one guy, it's very reliable, very simple. It's pretty easy to lock off that tension using it with the Porter app, like I'll show you in this video. Um, it's again, it's very easy to control. You can put quite a bit of force on it. Um, I particularly like to be able to, to double up when I'm pulling with this through a pulley. So I'm through a, a two to one and this device. If I do that, I can pull a thousand pounds pretty easily by myself. So simple, robust device, the setup difficulty. It's a little bit tricky just because those things can flop around and be misconfigured. Uh, brand new guys will have to be trained on it. And, and it's a little bit more expensive than the Mazda rope puller, a little more expensive than, say, a pulley or two cheap pulleys. Uh, but it's really not that expensive. I think it's uh, 320 bucks or thereabouts if you can get on sale for a little bit less. And you get, um, it's, it's a very versatile pulling tool. So my the next little video clip here is going to show one of the ways you can use that to pull. I'm using it here in a vertical configuration, but obviously you can do the same thing horizontally. So similar to the five to one, this probably gives me a comparable amount of tension. Um, what I can do here, again, I'm gonna throw a wrap, half wrap or a wrap on, on the actual porter wrap, and then I can crank this. And because it's mounted to the porter wrap, this device is actually maintaining the tension between the porter wrap. So this is pretty easy. I'll just keep taking the slack through until I'm happy with the tension here. And then this is a little bit of a tricky maneuver, but it works really well. I add some tension, I'll release the lower catch, take my wraps, capture that tension. I gotta capture it really tight. And then as I release this one, I should be able to get that off. And now we can lower on this device. Awesome. So that's one of the ways I used to use that. Um, it was kind of the replacement or what I used in lieu of a GRCS before I got one. Uh, now that I have a GRCS, I don't use that nearly so much anymore because, uh, and, well, I guess we'll, we'll get there. We'll, we'll talk, I'll talk about the GRCS. But uh, another alternative device is a compact five to one. You can use it in a very similar manner as that rope jack. You can use it in a lot of different ways. It's, it's very simple. There's not a whole lot to it. I've got one sitting here. Well, I'll show you one on the table in a minute. These are a few commercially available options here. We've got the Alo Red Ka, this uh, one called the Aztec that's made by Rock Exotica. This other one uh, by Harkin. I forget what it's called offhand. Um, all, all excellent devices. They're, Kale, um, can you show the uh, PowerPoint? These, these are all excellent devices. Two of them use ropes.
getting tangled. So this is one I built here in, in just a minute ago. Uh, again, it's, it's actually pretty expensive. I use quite a bit of expensive gear, but uh, yes. Oh, okay. After it's after we switched, or okay. So the uh, what I was just saying here is I've, I've got a little compact five to one system. It's essentially the same kind of idea as both the Harkin and the Aztec, except this doesn't have any built-in progress capture. But when I was using this, what I would store it essentially set up like this. I would store it all compacted, all ready to go, all sort of set up. But because I don't have a whole bunch of rope all open and stretched out, uh, it's a little bit slower to deploy perhaps, but it doesn't get all tangled up. And so I'll have the rope in a big bag. And when I go to use it, I'll just hook up the bottom, hook up the top, and then pull it, or I'll hook up one side and then pull the other side to whichever, to wherever my pull point needs to be. And then I'll start using it. But it just stores a little better when it's all compacted together. There's a lot of hardware, a lot of ways you can build one of those things. Um, you would have trouble building one for less than what you could buy the car for. <laughs> Uh, it's, so it's, it's a, actually a great option. So as far as our scale here, control, it, the control is, is, is good. You've got five to one. So you, one guy could pull, you know, roughly, oops, one guy could pull really hard by himself. Uh, input force, pretty high, five to one. Again, it's a lot of mechanical advantage. The distance of pull is kind of your big limiter here. You either have to set up a progress capture where you could kind of pull tension and then advance it again, then pull tension and advance it again. And that can be kind of tedious. Uh, same with uh, if you're trying to pull a really long distance, that would just be, it would be exhausting. And the setup can be tricky, especially if you build it yourself. If you buy one of these pre-made systems, it's not so bad. But if you build it yourself, it, it, I even just standing here a minute ago trying to figure it all out, it, it's just not intuitive and would require, require quite a bit of training to, to have someone else set it up, unless you buy one of these sort of pre-made systems. And they can be, um, they're pretty inexpensive though. It, it's a good way, a good, simple, robust way to, to get some serious pull and power. So this next little video here um, is again, one where I demonstrate using the car uh, to, to take tension. And you can see how I've, I've added in a, uh, a prusik in order to be able to advance the system. So I, I have more than one length of pull. I can pull it and advance it, pull it and advance it. Alternatively, another way you can do it, you get a lot more uh, tension out of this system. You can use a compact mechanical advantage system. Um, I'll show you with the CT, uh, CT rope puller here in just a second. But this is an Adelrid Ka. It's just a five to one system. And I've put a, installed a Pressic up here on my main line. And the cool thing about this is that I can now tension, I can pull a whole bunch of tension of this and then more in a more relaxed way, I can capture that. Now I can advance this again and I can do it again. I can pull, pull more attention. This actually has progress capture as well. So I just lifted a whole bunch of tension, a whole bunch of pressure into this line. And now I can go ahead and lock it off real easy there. And then release the mechanical advantage. And now I've got, once again, a tension line. So that says, in addition to the, the five to one, the car, I had a little soft shackle on the Porter wrap. And I had a pressic loop and a carabiner up on the rope. That's it. That's all the gear required. Uh, it's a good way to go. It's, it's one of, one of the, my preferred methods. Now, the, the capstan winch is another great option. Again, I'm always raving about the GRCS. The, when I first bought it, the first day I used it, I literally blew it up because I didn't integrate this little pulley that, so that the rope would fair lead into the uh, capture here. And I just like ripped the thing off the, the tree and oh, it made me cry. It was so sad. But the guys at, at GRCS were awesome. They like had me parts the next weekend and, and it was all back together and I've been using it ever since. Fantastic tool. The control is awesome. You have manual feedback. I actually even use a, a powered electric drill, high torque angle drill to spin it. You get 20 to one, one direction, 40 to one the other. So you really have a good sense of how hard you're pulling. The output force is phenomenal. You can get 2,000 pounds. I, I did, I tested it just like this. I got 2,000 pounds just with the hand crank. 
which was, by the way, the most I was able to get out of a 12 to 1 system that I set up with very little throw, a 12 to 1 compound pulley system. Now, the distance of pull on this, again, is also excellent. The only reason it's not five stars is uh, the, you can do better if you're pulling with a truck. <laughs> you know, you can, you can really get a longer pull if you're using a machine. But uh, otherwise, it keeps going. Because the rope feeds through it, you can pull as long as your rope is or until whatever it is you're pulling hits the, uh, the GRCS. Setup difficulty, it's not that hard, but it is, uh, it's not that complicated, but it is a little bit heavy and you figure it out, but it takes a little bit of setup. It's not, you could train someone pretty easily though. And the cost, uh, it's two stars because it's pricey. These things are a little over three grand uh, and you they still needed to add this extra little pulley and uh, in order to be able to have the rope leading in correctly if I'm pulling horizontally. If you're pulling vertically, you don't necessarily have to have that pulley so long as the rope is coming in from the top. But a great system. The capstan winch is, is excellent. I've used it for all kinds of circumstances and, and it's one that, that I've, I always tell people, yes, it hurts, it's expensive, but buy it and you'll never regret it. You'll use it over and over again. Uh, all right. Lastly, we've got pulley systems. So um, here's where I want to, to jump in. We'll do some demos here. I'll probably try and spend, I don't know, maybe, maybe 15 minutes or so building different pulley systems for you guys so you can uh, kind of understand the difference between simple and compound um, and, and see a few of my favorites. These, are, these can be great. You have really good control because, again, you're pulling by hand. The output force, you can get it as high as you want so long as you've got the mechanical advantage. Distance of pull, uh, maybe it shouldn't be four stars. These, these are hard to get a lot of distance with because, again, you're either introducing a whole lot of rope. And so your 400-foot rope through a five-to-one pulley only gives you 100 feet of pull, and that's a lot of rope to lay out. Uh, but it's um, – and you're limited. But you can also, you know, attach a prusik in advance. So there's ways you can kind of work with that. Setup difficulty, these, these are probably the most difficult to set up or the most technical to set up. They're not hard but you really have to understand it and they can get expensive. Using good pulleys, using good ropes, using progress capture, it's a little bit gear intensive. Uh, they, are, they are more expensive than some of these other options, but they're extremely versatile. That's what I like them. Um, very often I will use a two to one and then I will use like something like the rope jack if I wanna pull really hard. You know, I'll, I'll set, a, I'll set a, a pulley up in a tree up nice and high uh, using a long beefy three quarter inch bull line and then I'll run my first rigging line or pull line through that pulley and back. And then I'll be pull on that with a, with a rope jack or with a GRCS. And I know that I'm going to be able to pull just about anything over because I've got that mask of two to one. And if I need to pull more, I'll double it up one more time and, and have all the throw I want. So there's a lot of ways you can make them work. Um, we're, that's going to jump over here. And Kale, I would love to have your help sort of moderating the, the comments here because I'm gonna start going through these sort of at the beginning, but if, if folks have questions, then I would love to love to answer those. Let's see. Yep. The question, the question was, was tying so that, uh, that, that bow in. Yeah, the midline bow one that undoes uh, more easy, easily, or more easily than yep. the outline. So, so here's that here's, here's that, that bowline. So, so some of you guys have you learned guys how to tie an alpine, alpine butterfly this way, where you pull, where you pull the, middle one up, the middle one up. You go around. I'll oh, say I just did that just wrong because I don't. That's I don't, not how I tie it. So so this your typical your alpine typical butterfly. Alpine butterfly. Yeah. Gives you gives something you that's really nice, really easy to nice see, but you can pull any which direction, so that's nice, nice but, it but it jams down. down. The, uh, the, uh, the circus the bone is what we call, call it. it. There, there was a different, was a different name, name for that one that you, that saw. One you saw. You start with start three with loops around your hand, pull up the middle one, you go cross over one, cross over two, cross over three, and then you pull that last one up and out and set and dress it. And it looks funky, but... This can be, this loaded, can be loaded every direction. Every direction. 
and it doesn't, and it slip. doesn't slip. Binds really, Binds really good. It's going to give gonna you the, give have the you same have issues that any bowline has, has in that it'll that reduce the strength, the strength of the rope by, a, by 60 percent or so. But uh, but it's uh, much it's easier much to undo easier because, like a bowline, you can take one of these little chunks after you've loaded it and pry it down, and then you can kind of turn it, and then you can push this one down. And then you can and turn it and you can push that one, push down. that one down. And then it comes then out, it comes super, out easy. super easy. Even if it's, Even loaded, if it's hard. loaded hard. Can That's the circus bowling. Love, love, love that one. Good okay. night. Can you, can you do that one more time for me? Yeah, can I? Yeah, maybe I'll, I'll use a brighter rope, rope too because, too because I'll use this one. You see it a little better. So circus bowling so one, one, wrap your hand one, two, one, three times. You take the middle strand, pull a little bit of slack into it. Fold it over, over. Grab, this grab this middle strand, strand now, now, fold it over the other way, way. grab this middle strand, strand, fold it over the top, the top and now, now that last middle strand is the one that you pull and make your loop out of. <laughs> then you just got to work it all tight. The funny thing about this knot is it doesn't ever want to work tight. So even when it's dressed, it still feels like it's loose. It's funny. You're saying it's the circus knot? Circus bowlin is what they call circus. it. Circus. Circus bowlin. Yep. Okay. Gotcha. All right. One, two, three. One, two, three. Yeah, there you go. I did one extra there, but on the last one. Cool. All right, so for all of these demonstrations, um, I'm going to, we're gonna assume our load is over here, the base of our light, and we're pulling this direction. Try and pull that way. So the, the first way, obviously the, the easiest thing to do is one to one. I've got my hands, I pull. I'm gonna adjust that camera just a smidge. All right, here's our one-to-one. -one. This, you got about 140 pounds, right? That's all you got. Now, if I want to double this up, then what I can do is I can uh, either add a pulley midline, go double, go double line, or let's see, I'm going to pull some slack here because my top, the tip of this rope is already through a pulley. <laughs> And so now I'm going to actually lock this side off. Use, just use a clove hitch here because that's what we've got. Rather a girth hitch. Let's girth hitch that like that. So now when I pull here, I'm applying a two, I'm pulling here and my pulley is experiencing twice the load of my hands. One, because, because the load that I'm pulling gets transferred to this side. And so both these legs are, are pulling with roughly the same force, assuming we've got a 100% efficient pulley, which is never the case, but it's, it's usually close. And, and I've effectively doubled how hard I'm pulling. And you know that because I'm pulling here, this anchor point right here, this anchor point is also pulling in order to balance my pull out. And so we've got two forces pulling. Now that's, that would be a two to one, a two to one system. Now, generally you might think, oh, okay, well, let's go three to one next. But um, I almost never use a three to one because I can get a four to one with the same number of pulleys as a three to one. So to get a four to one, um, what I'm gonna do here is I'm actually going to Install a pulley. So I've got a uh, uh, because of what because of how I set this up here, it, it may be confusing. But just stop me if you're not getting it. So I'm going to tie my little bow in. And now instead of running, um, now instead of running through. A pulley here, this this new this is gonna be my, my anchor point. So I'm gonna go ahead and put a pulley here. 
I think to simplify this, I'm just going to use two ropes. Now you can do this with one rope, and generally when I do it, I use one rope. But for the sake of making it more obvious to see exactly what's going on, we're going to use two. So with one pulley, I've got two to one. And now I want to get, I'm going to double that by adding a second pulley. Now this is one where it would make sense to use a rope clamp or to use a friction hitch. You know, I could tie a friction hitch right here and add my pulley midline. I'm just going to go ahead and use this little rope clamp because again, I just, I'm the only one on the ground. I'm pulling by hand. So I don't care that I've got, I don't care that I've got a, a rope clamp on there. I'm not going to, I'm not going to max it out. I guess I should put an actual carabiner on this thing. All right. Now, if I go, so right now I've got two to one. If I take this tail, um, sorry, if I take my second rope here, I'll take my second rope and I go through this pulley and I lock off the other end of the second rope. Little clove hitch. This is now no longer in play. That's essentially slack, right? But I've got two legs of line here that are anchored at the base. And when I pull on this leg, I'm applying one vector, one, call it a unit of force. This load is seeing one unit of force. So that means that this pulling point is seeing two units of force, which means that this line is also seeing two units of force. So two plus two is four. So this is a, the most basic compound pulley situation. As I pull here, I get four units of force going into my my end point up here. Now, it's important to note that in compound pulley type situations, you want to think about where the most force is happening because my, I'm only pulling one to one here, but this is experienced double my load, double my force that I'm applying, and that end point is experienced four times. So the rope that I'm using as my anchor point, for example, if this was, if this uh, orange rope was up a tree, uh, if I, you know, pulled it through with a throw line, this needs to be the strongest rope of the whole bunch. You know, I could use my, I'll use my three quarter bull rope up on top and then I'll use maybe a half inch, whatever. And then I don't even care. I'll use my scrap line for this last bit because it's just not seeing much force. Same thing with pulleys. I'll use my big beefy pulley up here because that's seeing the most force. And then I'll use my weaker ones towards, towards the end. And that's one of the ways you can kind of get by using smaller, lighter, cheaper gear, uh, and still generate a lot of force. So on a four to one system like this, I was able to get uh, 620 pounds steady, and I was able to peak at 840 pounds using this four to one system. Uh, I pulled on a, on a load cell, and that's what I was, I'm 170 pounds, I'm strong, but not that strong, you know, like that's, you can still get almost 800 pounds of pull, which is more than what you can get with the rope jack just using just using what is two pulleys two pulleys two ropes now when i'm down ropes a lot of times i'll build this system more simply with just one rope and i'll show you guys how i do that so if i've only got the one rope i've still got a whole bunch of slack to play with so instead of locking off that other side i'll lock off right here a little clove hitch and now I'll bring the tail of that same rope back up there. Now this looks funny. It looks like a like a funky like a funky system. Cause this is slack. This strand's not doing anything. But when I pull here, I'm now I've got four to one again. Now if I instead of locking that off here. I install another pulley 
and I put a pulley here at, at our anchor. What is that going to give me? If you can do the calculation with me, I've got one unit of force here, two units of force. This one is seeing the same force as this, so this is a third unit of force going into this, so I've got three units and three units. This situation is now a six to one. So I went from a four to one with two pulleys to a six to one with three pulleys. I can generate an extraordinary amount of force. The other cool thing about this is that I've got six to one, but I can still pull the same distance. So I, I didn't lose any of my potential throw in my system by adding this pulley. All I did was gain a little bit more mechanical advantage. And because both of these lower pulleys closest to me, they're all of, both of them are only seeing at most double my force, I can again use fairly lightweight small pulleys. Now this might be a system where my, maybe I don't, if I have to pull real hard, I might not want to use this, this rope clamp anymore uh, because if I'm tripling my force three times 160 is going to be well, pretty, pretty close to, I mean, it's, that's still going to be less than the four kilonewtons that this is good for. But, um, but I'm, I'm not going to risk it. I don't want to put, you know, I don't want to damage the sheath of my rope. So this might be one where I instead stall, install a uh, hitch cord. So that's where I might tie a VT, Valentine Tress, or something similar. And there's a whole bunch of great friction, friction knots. You should all know a couple, especially if you're a climber, because if you climb, you never know when a particular rope just might not interact well with the, uh, with the knot that you're familiar with. So occasionally they don't. It's very useful to know more. The other advantage of having a hitch cord like this, obviously you can do the same thing with, a, uh, with the rope grab. You can, so I can, if I run out, of, uh, run out of room here, I can slide this back up. I can slide it up the rope and now I can get more throw. But more than that, if I lock this off, you know, and something's tight or maybe a branch falls on this and this is all jammed up and I'm not able to release it at the trunk for whatever reason, I can release this here. So that really comes into play. For example, when I was testing these all out, I, it was kind of a knucklehead and I put a hitch cord onto one of these lengths and I had it go in both directions so that, uh, there, so I used, I used a rope clamp so that I locked the whole thing up. There was no way to release it and it got complicated for a minute there. But I swapped the progress capture device I had out for hitch cord and I was able just to let it slide. So the beautiful thing about hitch cords is that they'll hold, they'll slip under really high load, which can be helpful and, and it's safe, but they'll all, they're also releasable. <laughs> so if you get in the pickle, sometimes you can, you can release them yourself. So one of the things I mentioned before is if I know I'm going to be pushing limits and I put a hitch cord in there. One of the things I'll do is just tie a little bit of a backup knot here below the hitch cord. So if I tie a backup knot right here, a little alpine butterfly, this backup's going to get, it's going to decrease my pull a little bit, or it's going to decrease the strength of my rope, but it's in this leg that's only seeing one times my force. So I'm not worried about it. And then if my hitch cord manages to slide because I'm pulling too hard, then it'll stop into this and lock off. And I get some information. I know that maybe that combo isn't good. Maybe I need to try a different knot. Maybe I need to cinch it down harder. I get good information. And information keeps you from making stupid mistakes if you know what to do with it. All right. I'm going to simplify this a little bit. Does anyone um, want to see the 12 to 1? It would be a little bit tricky here. If someone wants to see it, I'll set it up real quick here. This is a six to one. All you got to do is introduce another pulley up top. So we've got a double, a tripling, a doubling, and then a doubling. That you can get 12 to one, but it's not real practical. Um, it was just kind of fun to set up before. I want to show you guys the progress capture using one of these, the megawatt. Uh, you can do the same thing with a clutch or a Petzl rig or an ID if you've got it. I'm going to jump in here real quick. What is that? 
This is the, the megawatt by Edelrid. This is a, just a personal descender. And it's, a, uh, it's basically designed to, to be able to climb on. Um, but they also use these things as the bases for rescue systems. Again, if, I'm, if I've got this on the load, on the load line, where I'm, my physical strength is the only thing pulling the rope through it, I'm not going to overload this device because it's good. It, it, it'll, it's designed for a one man's pull as hard as it can go. Um, it's not a problem. That's another advantage of setting up a mechanical or a, a mechanical advantage system like this, where you've got all these pulleys. The final strand, the one you actually pull on, never sees that high of a load. Now, somewhere, some of the parts in the system do get incredibly high loads, potentially, especially the, far, the closer you get to your actual anchor point. Um, but the end, you don't. So this little personal system uh, you can use as like a little bit of a progress capture device. Now, be aware, ANSI says, don't mix climbing and rigging gear. So um, it's used with discretion and... Uh, this is debatably rigging, depending on how you're using it. But, you know, obviously you won't want to shock load it. But the beauty of these sorts of devices is even if you do shock load it hard, this becomes another friction uh, slipping point. So just like the hitch cord will slip under too much load, this device will slip under too much load. So long as you don't back it up, you're not going to damage the device by that rope slipping out of it. It should, it, it serves as a safety buffer. So basically, I've got that here against at my anchor. And now I can pull and it'll lock off as I release. If I want to release it, then I can operate this handle and it'll introduce slack back into my line. Does that make sense? I'm going to undo some of this here. Progress capture is a wonderful thing. I'll show another little cheaper option. If we've got, show you guys how to do a hitch cord. I've got another hitch cord sitting here. We've got a hitch cord. You take your hitch cord. This one requires actually kind of two, but uh, I'll just do this one for first. I'm gonna tie another little VT. This is gonna act as my progress capture. Now, anyone who's ever climbed on a system like this knows that that won't tend itself very well. Uh, you can, can't see it super well, but uh, as I pull here, I can slide that knot up and it's gonna maintain tension. And as it releases, it's gonna have a little bit of sit back, so I'm gonna lose a little bit of that tension. But one of the cool things you can do is integrate another pulley, another small pulley as a friction advancing setup. So you can, just like you would for a climb system, I can take one of these guys, slip it underneath here, and now I've got a hitch tender. And generally what I would do is I would tie it off over here to this. I don't know if this is gonna work here, but I would use another hitch cord going up here to hold onto this. Or you can use a rope clamp and a carabiner or whatever. Again, more gear, more complicated, but it does make it easier. And now it's simpler too. So as I pull here, that pulley tends the hitch cord for me. And I don't have to worry about advancing it. I can put two or three people on it which is another kind of nice thing. And no one actually has to stand here and tend the hitch. So I can just get more mechanical advantage that way. Now, I don't have to do that in this complicated six to one situation. I can do it even with just a two to one. And if I've got two guys and now, I've got two guys on a two to one and I'm getting you know four to one basically, but with the extra manpower. And that'll serve to, to lock it off. Uh, once you're done, once you've taken the tension, if you're worried about your hitches slipping, you can then just lock off that branch or lock off the remaining rope, just like I showed you guys in that other little video. 
And now you've got something that's going to be rock solid for you. All right, I'm going to probably, I've got a few more we could do, but I think I'm going to mostly call it here because I want to get to one last slide and uh, if give a little chance for some questions before the end. So mechanical advantage, I would be remiss to not mention using equipment to pull. Now, equipment can be very hazardous to use to pull. It's, um, it depends on your situation, depends on what you're doing. It can also be very safe. Now, uh, obviously, Big, heavy things can put a, exert a lot more force than us small, weak, frail humans. Um, and it's very difficult to measure how much force that is unless you've got a dynamometer and you're setting all sorts of crazy things up. But you can get, you can compromise for, in such a way that you can actually have more control if you know what you're doing. So obviously, uh, big equipment's the most expensive thing. Uh, it's pretty easy to set up. Usually you just tie it on and pull, right? Uh, distance of pull, that's the best thing about heavy equipment is it'll just keep pulling and pulling and pulling. It doesn't care. It doesn't get tired and it doesn't stop pulling hard unless you lose traction or something. And your output force, it's hard to pull any harder than you can with a, with a truck or with a skid steer, even a mini skid steer. The, the two big issues are cost and control. So if you already have the equipment, great. It's not extra cost. Uh, but control is a big one because, again, over pulling is a huge risk. That, that can cause all kinds of hazards, and it's really hard to know how hard you're pulling when you're in something big and strong. So one of the ways that you can mitigate that is how I was showing you here with the friction hitch. So maybe you put the truck on a friction hitch around one of your ropes, and if you pull too hard, the hitch slips. And so that, that's one way to mediate it. Another way that I've seen surprisingly few people do is actually integrating a porter wrap onto whatever it is you're pulling. So for example here, uh, I don't know if my, my face screen is covering everyone else's bottom right-hand corner, but uh, that device that's hidden behind my face, at least on my screen, is called a branch manager. Oh, there we go, thanks, Gail. And if you look at the, uh, I'm gonna over here at the top left-hand corner of the branch manager, what does that look like to y'all? It's a porter wrap. So I don't like where it's positioned on this device because pulling from up high like this will cause the device to tip forward. And so you limit some of how hard you can pull by putting it all the way up here. But this is a wonderfully useful piece of equipment because I can throw three wraps on there and have someone hold onto the rope. And now I have manual feedback and manual control of how hard my machine is pulling because they can let it slip. They can act like a clutch that's limiting just how hard we're pulling on the rope. And that is a fantastic solution. So I actually welded a, a cylinder with those little T bar on it uh, onto the side of my grapple. I just had a root grapple on my machine and it was fantastic. We used that thing almost as much as we used, uh, the, well, more than we used the GRCS. And the, when you have them both, it's incredible because now with all that pull distance, sometimes I'll just put a redirect at the base of the tree I'll have my rope coming off the machine through the redirect, up into the tree, through a pulley, and then down to a branch, and we can start lifting branches. So if I've got my machine pulling here, and then I've got these two pulleys, I can throw my, uh, do a little tip tie, have my ground, groundsman on the mini skid where he's facing me because, and backing up, and someone else is holding the rigging line wrapped around the porter wrap that's welded to my grapple. And he can let it slip if things get too crazy. He can let the rope run if it needs to, if it breaks free. There's a lot of potential control that you can do. So if I'm doing a tip tie rigging situation like that, sometimes I'll throw the GRCS on. Sometimes we'll just throw a pulley on the bottom and use the, use the ditch witch or use the machine. Um, it's, it's a really great way to minimize that, that particular liability. You can do the same thing with your truck. You can tie the port wrap onto one of your tow hooks in the front and just pull off the front of the truck using a tow hook or using the, the porter wrap. So that's generally how I recommend if you're gonna pull with something heavy, you know, if you need the, the force, you know, you use that and, and know the limits of your rope, know the limits of your truck. You know, obviously you, the traction and just how hard you can pull is, the traction is going to vary wildly and that's gonna determine just how hard you can pull. So a lot of times if I really need a lot of pull and I'm using the truck because I need all that power, oftentimes I will back up whatever I'm doing 
with a second line so that even if the truck slips, I will have another line that's locked off with a bunch of friction or I'll have a wrap or two around a tree that I can cinch and I can add friction if things start to sit back. Um, there's ways to, to make that more under control. The other thing to consider when using machinery, I'm thinking particularly like using an excavator. Excavators have incredible traction. They're really heavy. Um, and so occasionally you walk up to a back of a trunk or whatever, give it a little bit of a bump. Uh, I've seen this a lot on big land clearing or uh, roadside clearing. Sometimes the excavator is just the best, most efficient way to deal with it. Um, but you walk up to the back of the trunk, give it a little push, or run it out on the rope and give it a little pull. But the thing about these machines is they're very slow. Excavators in particular are really slow, but other machines are slow too. And sometimes you need to pull for a decent distance. So it is, it's oftentimes a good idea to trade off a little bit of leverage for the torque that these machines can offer. So sometimes if I'm pulling with a truck, for example, I will choke my rope around a trunk maybe at the halfway point rather than trying to get it really high and risk breaking out tops or risk having the rope pull through branches. I'll just choke it off 20, 30 feet up the tree knowing that I've got enough leverage because I'm pulling with some heavy equipment rather than, uh, and, and that, then I'm trading off some of my distance for the torque. So if we go back to our uh, very first little diagram here, you know, when I've got a whole lot of power, uh, I don't need so much distance of pull. And, and I can still get work done. The other way you can kind of do the same thing, or if you're using a machinery to drag brush up a hill where you, again, don't need that much force, but you've got a long way to travel, uh, you can use a reverse two to one, a one to two. You can put the pulley midline and then have the, the rope anchored past your load. And you can use the pulley, drag the pulley with the truck. And then you're getting twice the distance of material movement at half the distance of machinery movement. So that's another kind of cool thing you can do when you've got all that extra power to work with when you're dealing with heavy machinery. Obviously, you got to be really careful about uh, spring loading your ropes. If things break, making sure everyone's in a safe place. Um, no one should be in line with the rope. If you have a redirect, and I want to demonstrate this at the table real quick here. If you have a redirect in play when you're pulling really hard, then it's all the more important not to stand anywhere where that redirect, where if the redirect broke, it could fling things. So let's pull all this off of here real quick. We're just gonna go super simple. So I've just got, this is my pull rope. I'm pulling really hard in a straight line, but I, my anchor, so maybe, maybe this is where the road is. It runs over here, uh, but I need to pull the, the, pull the tree this way, more towards me. And so I redirect over off to a different, uh, different anchor point. So now I'm redirecting way over, over here and I'm pulling this way, keep my truck on the road, right? Well, there are a lot of danger zones in this configuration. If something snaps up here, the rope could come flying this way if something snaps over here, the rope would come flying this way. If something breaks right here at the pulley, the rope could go flying that way. So it's really important to know where those zones of danger are so that you can get your crew, get bystanders, make sure that you've gotten rid of anything valuable in any of those directions based on what you've decided is your weakest link. So as you introduce more variables, more redirects like that, you have to just spend more time thinking through, all right, What's the worst case scenario? What could go wrong? And how do we avoid that being catastrophic? All right, I, I'm gonna call it there for now. I wanna give us a few minutes to ask for questions. We got, we got 10 minutes. Uh, Kale, do you, you got any good ones there? So I have this problem where I think you've done such a great job that I don't really have any questions here. Uh, <laughs> I know people have been paying attention because uh, they've been yelling at me when, whenever I like the audio goes out or something like that. But uh, yeah, no questions so far. There's a little bit of delay. 
Um, I'm sure when uh, they hear that you're asking for questions that some will start. Uh, I just want to reiterate that this idea of being uh, keeping people away from the inline danger of, of the line that you're pulling on uh, is important because that's something that but personally I haven't heard anyone talk about and I've done a whole bunch of these webinars um, yeah I mean that's so I that's I really a huge like that. thing that it's so easy to get caught um, I, like I'm always yelling at groundies and of course if whoever it is who's pulling on it and this is one of the risks of, of the manual pulling methods you almost inevitably have to stand in line mm -hmm. if you can tuck yourself behind a tree and pull great if you can't you are a little bit in line and that's why again to, to mitigate this uh, it's useful to know where the weak links are and to set the weak links in such a way that if they break it pulls things away from you so if i'm for example using a rope jack anchored to a tree with a rope that goes out and back, I want to make sure that the pulley out there and the uh, sling around that tree and whatever it's anchored to is plenty, plenty, plenty strong so that if something breaks, it's going to be on my end. <laughs> so it could go away from me. But, uh, but yeah, anytime you've got things in either direction, that can, it can happen. I mean, it's so fast. It's so fast. That's, and if you're pulling with trucks, you almost inevitably end up having a redirect or two because the truck has to stay on the road or it has to stay on good traction. And so you have to get the rope down to where the vehicle is. And so that just amplifies the number of potential failure points. Oh, I've, I've, I've seen all the compilation videos of uh, people using chains to pull stumps out of the ground with their trucks and the stump goes through the back of the truck and breaks the oh my gosh. and stuff. Um, yeah. Yep. The the other thing is that, uh, uh, yeah, that I, I I do think it's important that people know how dangerous that is, pulling in line with that. Um, there's they actually do a, a a tug of war ceremony or like a a thing in India every year yeah. with like hundreds of people, where if the rope snaps, it pulls people's arms off. Like it's it's yeah. an amazing yeah. amount of force. Uh, yeah, JJ well, well, d yeah. You just, you just don't think, don't like, think like, like, oh, we, yeah, we've got yeah, 20 we've people on this. But you got 20 people, pull, like, if they're big guys, they're pulling nearly 200 pounds. It's 40,000 pounds. <laughs> you could break a <laughs> big a rope with That's that. That's dangerous. Yeah. Um, okay, so JJ is asking, where do you tie everything off? Uh, like, off the port wrap, or do you use a rigging plate? Um, rigging plates are awesome. I don't generally own them. Uh, a lot of times what I will do is, that's a great question, by the way. Uh, a lot of times what I'll do is I'll have, I will have one thing on the, the loop of the porter wrap, and I will have another end anchored around the tree. And that gives me a little bit of space because the twisting thing is a problem. Anytime you've got too many ropes too close together, they start to twist up and then you lose some of your advantage. So I'll have one or two ropes on the tree typically. Um, and, and then that's it. If I have more than three contact points, then I'm almost always going to use something else. I'm going to use a rope jack or I'm going to use a, a car or whatever. But uh, yeah, so I, I don't usually anchor them all to the same point. If you had a rigging plate, that would be cool, but it's not really necessary. Um, yeah, I'm tying raw ends of rope or I'll, I'll use the bite. I'll take a, make two wraps around the tree with a bite and then a couple of half hitches. If you anchor a rope around a tree like i showed you guys in that video you actually the you get a lot higher percentage of the rope strength and you make it really unlikely that the rope is going to break there because the friction around the tree is distributed really evenly around the rope so that the point where the knot deflects the rope is actually it doesn't experience much force and so you, you can get you know 90 95 percent of your ropes mbs with that sort of extra wrapping whereas if you tie a knot around a carabiner that almost that always becomes the weak link. That's where you lose 40 to 70%, depending on what knot and what ropes and, and what carabiner and all that. So. All right, great. Uh, the other thing I have here is uh, on our YouTube, Homer Jr. asking if you can demonstrate the uh, one to two mechanical advantage with pulling with a truck. Okay. Yeah, I'll show you guys over here real quick. Yeah, we can. 
So the one to two is only relevant when you're trying to pull something a distance. So, so I'll show it kind of in that scenario. I've got my rope here. Let's just say we are, we've got some, uh, we'll use my green bag that I had as an anchor over here. This is now our, um, this is our pile of brush that we're trying to drag along the road a long way. Sounds good. And this rope, this, or, or this orange woodpecker rope is the one we're gonna use. So the first thing you do is you anchor one end of the rope off, anchor one end of the rope off to something past your, uh, or around the same area <laughs> that you're actually pulling stuff out of. So got your, your one thing anchored down below. And then I've got my, my uh, pulley here. That's what's gonna, that's where the truck's gonna get attached. Probably I would, have another tether going to the truck, but I'll just hold it with my finger. And then I'm gonna tie this end right here. Let's see, we'll go. This one's better with a lot of rope. <laughs> you, need, you need kind of long distances because I can only ever pull, um, well, until that reaches me. So if I pull this right now, I'm pulling, my hand moves half the distance that the bag moves. Reset that there. Does that make sense? Cool. Yeah. Um, that is all of the questions I have so far. Uh, just Great. I hey. Thank you again. I have one question for you. Uh, is there anything that you want to, that you think uh, your coworkers at Edelrid would like you to talk about right now? Um, yeah. I mean, I'd love to, uh, there's all kinds of things that probably the, the big one right now is just the, the I want to talk about the tree rack saddle briefly. Um, I, my YouTube video I did when I only had it a week or two, didn't do it justice. And, uh, and they're going to be going on sale in a couple places here this summer. So just keep your eye out for that because it is a really cool, very fully featured saddle that, uh, at, at kind of a ridiculously low price point for as, as fully featured as it is. Um, it's one I've been using for a couple years now. Got a couple quirks. It's not perfect, but it's great. <laughs> it is really you're, good. You're climbing on the tree rex? Yep, the tree rex. I'll show you guys. Nice. All right. And it's got some it got some kind of cool features that you won't see anywhere else. Um, one of them, this is mine that I've got all beat up, and I've got some weird mods to it. But one of the cool things it's got is this little, uh, it's called the SRT loop. And it's just another rated attachment point, but it's super close to your body. So when you want your system nice and close and tight, like when you're working on a spar, it gives you a great point of attachment. And then we have a, a chest harness that integrates with that, that makes this uh, fall arrest, like a CE fall arrest rated system. So you can climb right out of your bucket truck, wearing this right into the tree, which is nice too for all you bucket bunnies. And then a totally underrated, but really awesome feature are these gear loops. They're just perfect. Like you couldn't have better gear loops, which is kind of a dumb thing to say, but it's so nice that they, they don't really snag. They're just slim enough, but they stick out and they're rigid. So they hold up really well. And you can always like rack your gear. You always know where it is. Um, and then of course it's got the little plates on the sides that gives you kind of a secure spot for your bigger carry tool, rock exotic or transport or whatever. And uh, the, the, Awesome ventilation too. They breathe breathe like nothing else. Awesome, great. Yep. Well, thank you very much, Josiah, for doing this. Thank you, uh, Edelred, for lending us Josiah. 
uh, I have a feeling we'll be doing uh, some more projects uh, together in the future. Uh, in fact, I uh, think I'm allowed to say that uh, we are starting a new initiative on sustainability uh, in concert and coordination with uh, Edelred and their Climb Green project um, to, uh, to kind of bring some more sustainable options in the tree care industry on, on products uh, to our store, to, to tree stuff, and to, I guess, the, uh, the entire industry as a whole. Edelred's really yeah. leading the way on that with their Climb Green um, I don't know if you want to talk about that a little bit. Yeah, just two seconds. Yeah, I'll, I'll give you. I, I'm stoked to be working with you guys. I think what you're doing is awesome. It's going to make a difference on the industry at large. Uh, doing something that's, that's hard to do, the, the transition to more sustainable manufacturing, more sustainable practices is always uh, challenging and expensive to be the front runner. It's an investment to be sure. So if you guys don't know, Tree Stuff's going to be doing, they're going to be kind of highlighting some products, not just from us, but from, from folks all over that are, that are stand out and exceptional in their, in their, the whole manufacturing process or in some other way that, um, that they are, maybe they're just built to last forever with all these great replaceable parts, or they've uh, used less water, or used less power, or they're made of recycled materials, whatever it happens to be. Those things are, are not easy to do, and, and it's often more expensive than just doing it the, the, the way it's always been done. Um, so I'm stoked to, to see you guys kind of highlighting some of that. And yes, for the moment, Aylord will feature prominently because we've been doing that a long time. It's something that the Germans care a lot about and, and have invested in for, for a decade now. Uh, but it'll be good to see the whole industry have that opportunity to show off a little, too. I think it'll bring, bring everyone forward. Yeah, we, I was supposed to post about that on uh, Earth Day, but I, I didn't have a, a logo artwork drawn up yet, so that was my yeah. bad. But we'll have that soon. Um, thank you very much, Josiah, for your time. Um, and everyone, make sure that you find that link to the quiz uh, in the comments. I will post it in a moment here in the description. If you get 16 out of 20 on that quiz, then uh, you can get two CEUs for free. That's if you're watching it right now. If this is in the future, like six or seven days from now, uh, it's only going to be worth one. But you will always be able to come back, watch this again, take the quiz, earn a CEU just from watching it and uh, passing that. So uh, yeah, thank you very you got much. Any other topics yeah. you're really interested, want to hear about, post them in the comments, and uh, we'll try and get to them. If we can't get to them yes. during a webinar, maybe, uh, maybe Strider will make a video about it. Yeah, definitely. All right. Thank you very much, and have a nice night, everybody. I'll take